way I look at things. Well, my wife is in Dallas. Don't you feel sorry? I've had to cook for myself all week. Oh. My, uh, my granddaughter is moving back to Dallas to Greenbrier, and uh, she has three children, and my wife just felt like she just had to be there to help her. Uh, we have nine grandchildren, three greats, and, and she feels like she has to help every one of them. My brother-in-law lives right next door to me, my wife's brother, and uh, his wife's gone. And so we just cried on each other's shoulder yesterday. <laughs> and uh, I had to fix this steak and baked potato. And, uh, we were really suffering for Jesus. Which might have missed a little bit. <laughs> but uh, pray for them as they, uh, as they come back tomorrow. And, I always uh, want to protect them with the power of prayer. Amen. Bob mentioned it this morning, and uh, and, and I, I like that, uh, what he had to say in the devotion. That was exceptionally good. I appreciate it. And, uh, but the, the blood, Jesus said when he lifted that cup, is the new covenant in my blood. We are in covenant relationship with Almighty God through Jesus Christ. And that means so much more, I think, than, than what we recognize. And so I, I want to look a little bit uh, into the Old Testament and, and get some background there. The 15th chapter of Genesis, I told Jim I was going to start in, in Genesis and end in Revelation, but I won't. Uh, I'll try to stick to this one chapter. But if you would stand with me just a moment. As we read, beginning at verse 7 of the 15th chapter of Genesis. Uh, just uh, a little background. Sometime after God called Abram to follow him, the two were having a conversation. Have you ever, ever have a conversation with God? Uh, I find it easy just to converse with him throughout the day. Not, 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 not some glorious prayer, just a conversation with God. And, and God reminded Abraham of the original promise that he had concerning getting that promised land, getting Israel as we know it. And Abraham asked how he could be certain. You ever ask God questions like that? Lord, now I know you said that, but how can I be certain that, that you're going to do that? And God made a statement that only Abraham would understand. And we find it here beginning in verse 7. And he said to him, He took him outside and, and, and he said to him, Look up into heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him for righteousness sake. And then here it says, Then he also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, O oh, sovereign Lord, how can I know that I'll gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. And Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And then down to verse 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. And then he goes on to describe it the land of Israel. Father, thank you for your word this morning. I pray you would open our minds to all that you have for us through this, that we can understand exactly what you want from us and what you have given us through the death, burial, and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Now, God gave some pretty unusual instructions, but Abram knew exactly what he meant when he said, go 
get a heifer. I had a guy at, uh, every time I preach about this, my, my wife, if she was sitting here, she'd start laughing because we had a guy at Greenbrier and, and he was being very complimentary when he said, you know, your wife is a fine heifer. <laughs> so, um, she was complimented by that. Well, when, when God said that to Abraham, the reply was not a surprise to him. He knew exactly what was going on. Sacrificing a heifer was the language of a contract between two people in Old Testament times. In the ancient Middle Eastern world, a practice called making covenant or cutting covenant was practiced uh, between heads of state and, and, and different quote, people. The closest comparison, I guess, that we can think of in this kind of contract is marriage. However, with the, the, the divorce rate the way it is, uh, uh, it, it, it's kind of even hard to compare marriage to that. But once a person entered into a covenant, and this being a blood covenant, it was an everlasting thing, and, and they could not be released from it, neither party. And so God was saying, Abraham, I, I'm going to go into this covenant with you, and this will be between us and your people forever. Now, in the culture of Abram, it was common for the tribal chiefs and the different ones to do this, and they would do it out in an open field, usually before several different witnesses. And, and, and all of the aspects of this covenant were, were so applicable today, are so applicable today to us as, as, as Christians under the new covenant that I, I think it's a, an amazing thing. The covenant-making ceremony involved several steps. It was just an agreement between two people, and uh, no, normally uh, th this was done, as I said, with many witnesses. And several things took place. First of all, step one of this covenant-making ceremony was the exchange of robes, and, and it represented an exchange of identity. Uh, the two parties would take their outer garments off and they would trade them with each other. And if someone saw one of the partners from a distance, they'd say, you know, that looks like old Jim Sanders over there, but he doesn't look like him. It just doesn't look like him at all, but he's got Jim's clothes on. And so he's built like Jim, but it's just not Jim. There's something I can't quite put together there. You see, the exchange of robes represented a confusion of identity. Now, let's go forward. 2,000 years. And when Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for us, just before he went to the cross, he prayed there in John chapter 15. He said, Lord, I want to be in them and them in me. And when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we take on his identity and we are Christians. We are little Christ and the Holy Spirit living within us just exudes love and peace and joy and patience and all of the fruits of the Spirit. So there is a confusion of our identity with the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not our own. We're bought with a price. And we exchange that road with Him. Praise God. The second step was the exchange of belts. Now, th this represented an exchange of strength. The covenant partners literally would change belts. The one that I'd have to get a, a pretty hefty <laughs> partner for that, to take my belt. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, they would exchange these belts, and, and they were different. They, these belts were usually pretty heavy and pretty wide, and they were used to carry military gear. They would hang their knives and their swords and everything, whatever their assets were, they would hang there, and, and that represented an exchange of assets. If, if I exchange my belt, my covenant partner would be saying, Jim, everything that I bring into this relationship is now yours, and everything you bring is now mine. That's why it sounds a lot like the marriage covenant. My wife reminds me quite often, you pledge me all your worldly goods. <laughs> she didn't get much, but anyway. So, the, the exchange of belts represented an exchange of uh, of all that they had. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul said, My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory. Wow! We 
bring our meagerness and God brings His greatness. Everything that He has, when we exchange that belt, we, we come and say, Lord, I don't have much. Simply, uh, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. But when I cling to the cross, I get at, at, at my disposal all of the riches of heaven. Somebody needs to shout. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. We, we find that whatever little we have, God takes and then He supplies our needs according to His riches and glory. Well, a lot more, so hang on. Third step in the covenant-making ceremony was the exchange of weapons that hung on the belt. And, and this would symbolize an exchange of enemies. You see, my covenant partner would say, Jim, if anybody comes against you, he or she is going to be coming against me. And if anybody comes against me, then you're going to be there to have my back. I would be his protector and he would be mine. When I come to the Lord Jesus Christ, what does he say? Put on the whole armor of God that you might withstand the very darts of Satan himself. We are robed and we, we take on the, the armor of God and we take on the weapons of God and not by flesh and not by blood but by the power of His Spirit. What a wonderful covenant relationship we have in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then He said just to top it all off, greater is He that's in you than he that's in the world. Satan, do what you want to. I've got a God that is at my back and Give it your best shot because God's going to take care of me. He's in control. He's on the throne. And greater is he that's in me than you that are in the world. Praise the Lord. Well, Amen. the fourth step was the sacrifice of an animal or several animals as we read about. And here the idea was that the animal had to be cut in two. Uh, normally, a heifer would be laid on its back and be sliced down the underside of its belly. Sounds kind of grotesque, I know. But it, it, its legs would be folded out. And the, the sacrifice of the animal is why we term this covenant the blood covenant. The blood had to be shed. There, was, there were other covenants. There was the, 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 the covenant in Eden. There was the, the covenant with Noah. But this is a blood covenant. And every time a blood covenant was made, a sacrifice was, was needed. Life must be given and blood must be shed. And when God asked Abram to get a heifer, Abraham didn't say, a heifer? <laughs> I, I, I wanted a contract. What about the land you promised? What about all the things that you promised me? Abram knew that this heifer was a written contract, written in blood, and that it was irrevocable. It was going to be forever. Without the shedding of blood, there is no repentance. And through the blood uh, that was shed by the Lord Jesus Christ, we have our redemption. He was that heifer. He was that sacrifice. He was the one that suffered that you and I could be in covenant relationship with God. And by the way, as we look at this, and we recognize that this was a covenant with Abram. God was saying to Abram, for everlasting, this land that I promised, be yours. Israel still belongs to the Jews. Amen. It is still God's people. They may not be serving Him, may not be living for Him in the way that we see in biblical understanding, but God had promised, and I'll, I'll guarantee you that at the end of this world, they're still going to be in possession of that little strip of land that God Amen. promised Abraham nearly uh, 4,000 years ago. The fifth step of this covenant was the, the walk of death. Now at this point in the ceremony, the covenant partner, partners would, would stand facing each other in an open field and the animal lay open there and the, the partners literally walked through uh, this mass of blood. Now don't, uh, this is just the way it happened. And, and one would walk through and come back on the other side. And as they walked through, Certainly, some of that blood would get on them, and this became the blood covenant. They would, they would just get the blood on them of that sacrifice. And when we come to the, to the communion table, and we recognize that the cup is a symbol of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we recognize that we are under the blood. I'm covered by the blood. 
covered by the blood. Praise God. My sins are covered by the blood because of the sacrifice of Calvary. I am in a covenant relationship with God so that everything about my past is gone, thrown into the sea of His forgetfulness. God remembers it no more, and I don't need to worry about it anymore because it's under the blood of that covenant relationship that I have with Jesus still walk through that covenant making process with God today through Jesus Christ. Now the next step, and I think this is, this is an interesting area that took place, they would place a mark on their body. Uh, in the old culture it was the striking of hands. Now I, I'm not sure, I've, I've, I've done a little research on this, but uh, uh, did any of you ever have a friend that you did a became a blood brother with? The uh, problem <laughs> with becoming a blood brother is you've got to get a little blood out of you. And, and I have a friend over in Clarksville, Arkansas that I grew up with, and, and uh, we became blood brothers. And, and I'm not real sure our blood really got together, but we made a little scratch there on the arm. And, and so the, the striking of hands meant that they would, would put their wrist, they would make a mark, and then they, they would grasp their hands like that. Some say that this is, this is where the custom that we have of shaking hands with each other comes from. Makes sense to me. But anyway, they would put this mark on their body and, and, and they, would, uh, they would say that, that, that this uh, is our covenant relationship with each other. And, and, and as they shook hands with one another, they would say we are cutting covenant together. The two individuals would clasp hands as the blood from their freshly cut wrists would, would mingle together and the covenant mark on their wrists or on their palms where it was made might be there at, at, in, in reference to what over in Isaiah 49 and 16 in which God says, I have inscribed them on the palms of my hands. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Our names, our, uh, our beings are inscribed on the palms of, uh, of God's hands. Amen. Listen, Amen. even better than that, there are some marks on the hands and the feet of my Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Hands and feet that were pierced because of my sin. Scars that were placed there. Marks that are symbols of that covenant relationship that I have with Jesus Christ. And one of these days, when I get to walk through, whether it's golden gates or whatever it might be, when I walk into His presence, I can sing like the, the, the songwriter wrote many years ago, I shall know Him, I shall know Him. And redeem by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him by the prince of the nails in his hand. I'll know him because of what he did for me, and he'll know me because I have that mark of his blood shed on my body, and I'll be a, a redeemed forever in that covenant relationship with my Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And then, a couple more. The seventh step was in, in making this was the pronouncing of blessings and curses. That this occurred in the presence of the witnesses, and one would stand in front of the other. And this is where a lot of, uh, of the marriage ceremony really comes from. They would stand in front of the witnesses, and, and uh, they would say something like, Well, so long as you keep the terms of this covenant, blessed will you be when you go, when you come. Uh, blessed shall you be, uh, shall you be when you rise up, when you lay down. Blessed will be your wife. Blessed will be your home. Blessed will be your children. Blessed will be all you put your hands to do. And then the opposite will be true. But if you break this covenant, then cursed shall be your life. Cursed will be your wife. Cursed will be your children. And on and on they go. And when it ended, the partner would pronounce the same blessing and the same curses and the pronouncements then signified that the two people were entering into a oneness. There's no reservation. No holding back. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Paul wrapped it up quite clearly in Romans when he said we are to present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Him, which is our reasonable act of worship, our reasonable service. When we come to Him, we're going to say, Lord, uh, lock, stock, and barrel, I'm yours. Everything I have, everything I am, I come to you, and I pray that today you will take my life, and you will bless me, and I will bless you according to to your word. Now, uh, then there is the covenant meal. And I, I like this. The eighth step of this covenant making relationship. The partner sat at the table before the witnesses and they shared a meal together. And, and the partners didn't begin by feeding themselves. They fed each other. And they would say, as you are ingesting this food, are you listening now? As you're ingesting this food, you are ingesting me. What did we just do? We took the bread, the covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we ingested that bread. And he's saying, you're ingesting me. When a bride and groom feed each other the cake, it's a symbol that they're in a covenant-making relationship. I, I, I like that. I don't like it when they start mashing each other's face with the cake. <laughs> Not a good start to a... a, a <laughs> you see, when we come to the communion table. We participate in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord, and we take that bread, and we're ingesting the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And then, last of all, there was a, a step in which the partners stood facing each other in an open field. And it was making a covenant with each other. They would exchange names. It would be like this. Well, if I was in a covenant with you, I would say no longer am I going to be Jim Sanders. I'm going to be Jim Bishop Sanders. And from now on, in our covenant relationship, you're going to be Bob Sanders Bishop. We exchanged names, and there was that, again, that identity there that we knew that we were in covenant with each other. And here's a great thing. When Adam or when Abram came to the Lord and the Lord said, now we're in this covenant relationship and since we have done this, he said, I, I, I'm going to change your name from Abram to Abraham. The two letters that are added are A-H and that comes from the word Yahweh, the name of God that appears approximately 6,800 times in the Bible. We pronounce it Jehovah but God doesn't stop there. True to His covenant, He takes Abraham's name, and from this point on, you'll hear Him referred to as the God of Abraham. Woo! I like that. God takes on a covenant relationship with us. In ancient Hebrew, there were no vowels, only consonants. And, and the letter A in Yahweh is a pronunciation aid that was later added so that we could say Yahweh. And, and originally it's Y-H-W-H, but we put the A's in there so it, it's easier for us to say. And the letter Hebrew, or the Hebrew letter H is the sound of breath, literally signifying the breath and the presence of God. In Genesis 1, we read about the creation of man and woman. And when God made Adam from the dust, the first man was merely a body. But what made Abraham or made Adam live? The breath of God. And we see the same concept today in God's New Testament. The Holy Spirit is called the Holy Numa or the Holy Breath or Puff of God. And so we can see the significance of the letter that symbolizes breath being in the middle of Abraham's name as a symbol that God was a covenant partner, partner with him. And when we come to Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Breath of God, envelops us and fills us, and we have the breath of God, the presence of God within us, and we are in a covenant relationship with the God of all creation. Let's just give him praise this morning. So when we come to the table of the Lord, it's much more, as Bob said this morning, it, it's much more 
than so many times what we anticipate it to be. It is a time of recognizing that you and I are in a covenant relationship with God. An irrevocable covenant. A covenant that will last forever. The blood covenant of the shed blood of Jesus Christ our Amen. Lord and Savior. Amen. So what shall we do? We will walk in covenant with Him and honor Him and please Him and recognize that we have a God that loves us beyond measure. Amen. Let's not get over that. Amen. Wherever you are today, God loves you more than you could ever imagine. Whatever you're struggling with, God is the answer. He has the answer, and He will guide you as you walk in covenant relationship. Let's stand together just a moment. Father, I thank you this morning for your presence. And what a, what a privilege it's been to worship you together with the church. And I, I, I just would have to pause a moment, Lord, and recognize that if there's someone here that has a special concern or need, that uh, these altars are always open. And, Amen. And we want to pause to just give that opportunity. Someone may be struggling today, needs to pray, needs the church to pray with them. Maybe someone here that's never accepted Christ as Savior, never entered into that covenant relationship. And today would be a great day to do that. So we just pray now as we wait before you with our heads bowed, just as quietly letting you search our hearts that we say yes to you. Whatever the If you are in a situation where you have a need this morning, or if you'd like to accept Christ as your Lord, yeah. these altars are open to you. I'd like to come in just a moment and we'll wait and have a closing prayer with you. appreciate your attendance this morning. You know, if, if, as being in covenant relationship with God, we each one are in covenant relationship with each other. Amen. And so, before you leave, if there's uh, someone you just need to go say, you know, I'm glad to be in a covenant relationship with you. And if there's someone you can't say that to, well, we've got an offer. <laughs> <laughs> no, tell someone how, you, how much you appreciate and love them before you go this morning. All right, God bless you. Have a good day. Yes.